The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the very first in our new webinar series focused on the COVID-19 crisis and its wider impact on the aviation and travel industry. Uh, my name is Daniel Boyle, and I'm the Director of Transport here at Terrapin UK. Uh, it's, it's, look, it's obviously a, a sombre and a sobering time in the industry at the moment. Uh, air transport and travel uh, have been you know, one of the hardest hit from the very early days of the, the outbreak in January this year, when we began to see that initial uh, demand plummet. Um, you know, our thoughts at this time do go out to the airlines, uh, the airports, and the, the wider supply chain that has been uh, irrevocably impacted by this, this global pandemic. Uh, so I guess to help keep the industry up to date, we, we've launched our State of Play series. Uh, this series is gonna feature experts from various regions who can update you on the state of play uh, at the time of publishing in their specific regions. Uh, today, we're gonna be covering Europe. The next webinar, which takes place next Tuesday, the 7th of April, uh, will cover the US and will be hosted by Henry Hartbelt. And the following Tuesday, the 14th of April, we're gonna be hosting our APAC session with Cheng Li from the IAR. Um, and then the, the next week after that, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna welcome Shashank Nigam from Simply Flying, who will be hosting a, a slightly different session looking at how can airlines restore brand confidence through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, you can sign up to all of these webinars online, uh, either on the World Aviation Festival website, or if you go to terrapin.com slash aviation. And we're gonna be hosting more webinars in the near future. And um, we're just currently developing content and schedule for those. So if you are interested in um, hosting or joining a webinar, please do feel free to contact me directly at daniel.boyle at terrapin.com. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, we wanna make this as interactive as possible. So please submit your questions during the presentation. Um, and I'm gonna follow up afterwards to try and ask John as many questions as possible. Uh, if we run out of time, John is more than happy to get in touch via email. Uh, so just please make sure that you do leave your email address with your question. Um, obviously, at times like these, uh, it's great to get some insights uh, from those who've you know, seen it all and have a vast amount of experience. Uh, John has 38 years in the industry. Uh, he's worked with some very well-known legacy and low-cost carriers. Um, if you've been to the World Aviation Festival, uh, you will have seen John on stage interviewing um, some of our airline CEOs. Uh, if you're based in Europe or in the UK, you may have seen John on the BBC um, or Bloomberg. Uh, he's an, often a, a commentator on aviation. Um, and he's also very good at conveying complex industry issues clearly. Um, he runs his own consultancy called JLS Consulting. So I'd like to welcome, welcome and hand over to John Strickland. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, Daniel. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you uh, on the line. I know we've got uh, many friends and industry colleagues here today. As Daniel said, it is a, a very somber time for this uh, industry, but I think we all, all love so much. And on the one hand, I'm honored that Daniel's asked me to talk about the topic today, but uh, it certainly is perhaps the most difficult thing. I'm sure it's the most difficult thing I've ever had to reflect on in my time in the industry. And indeed, for all of us, it's a challenge, the like of which we've never seen before. But I want to try to take this calmly this afternoon and not really be uh, sensational or fearful about what is going on around us. Uh, we see plenty of that uh, in the media, but more to look at what has been the consequence of uh, the virus so far uh, since uh, it uh, joined us, so to speak, in recent months and uh, what the industry has been doing about it and then look at some scenarios as to what might happen next. What should we realistically expect? And of course, none of us know the answer. I'm hoping some of you are going to ask questions about it and give your comments as we go along. But let's kick off. Uh, hopefully, we'll go through these uh, slides in about uh, 20 minutes and then there should be plenty of time for your questions. So. First of all, let's remind ourselves just how important uh, this industry is. Uh, IATA and ATAG, the industry bodies, have talked 
in recent times about the importance of aviation supporting 10 million direct jobs worldwide, 10 million indirect jobs, and up to 60 million jobs when you take into account the catalytic effect on tourism of air travel. However, the sad reality is this is not likely to be the same in the future new normal whenever we get to that position. Sticking with the ARTA, well, they've been putting out forecasts in the past two or three weeks of uh, the type of hit they think the industry uh, may incur from the, the, the damage caused by uh, COVID-19. They started a few weeks back with uh, an estimate of uh, around about $60 billion. The most recent uh, evidence they've put out here is showing, of course, a, a, both a massive dip in uh, revenues, a massive dip in volume two down here, and they now give a figure of maybe a $252 billion hit for the industry. Uh, they don't see uh, an easy coming out of this uh, crisis either. They've drawn comparison with previous ones, such as SARS, such as 9-11. Uh, well, we saw recovery uh, quite often in a matter of months. This is not likely to be similar, unfortunately. Uh, they expect it to be a much longer period of, uh, of recovery before we get to any semblance of normality, and that will likely be very different to what we see today. I think it's fair to say this is the biggest shock ever that the industry has experienced, uh, bearing in mind the industry in its modern form has not been through either of the two world wars, but this is a war of sorts. So affecting the whole of humanity. And it's really the sheer magnitude of a challenge. Everything happened. I mean, I've just been aghast, as I'm sure all of you have, in watching the, the news flow and the uh, communication from airlines in recent weeks, the way that bookings just melted away. They literally fell off a cliff in a matter of uh, a few days uh, in the months ahead. Uh, existing reservations began to be cancelled as people became fearful of traveling or wanted to get back home. Uh, and worried about being trapped in uh, overseas countries. Borders closed, which of course compounded a problem. And then the quarantine impact was uh, another element in this factor too, because even if people were willing to travel until a week or two ago, they didn't want to get stuck somewhere abroad in quarantine. Uh, and indeed that gave problems for airlines in planning of uh, flight and cabin crew too, who were going to areas which were early into this uh, challenge uh, where they too would have to be quarantined and taken offline. Now, of course, all these bookings melting away has been a massive and immediate hemorrhaging effect for airlines. The blood loss has just been phenomenal. Uh, and in many cases, that's led to severe, and I would say fairly, uh, it's potentially life-threatening for some airlines, really fatal liquidity challenges as uh, cash is drained out of uh, businesses. And airlines have had to react quickly to stem that blood loss. It's been imperative to protect cash. Cash, absolutely king in these type of scenarios. We've seen massive flight cancellations, the like of which we've never seen before, and aircraft grounded. We, of course, pictures are all over the internet, all over social media now of fleets uh, of aircraft grounded worldwide, often the entirety uh, of uh, airlines fleets here. We've got examples at South End Airport in the UK, of uh, primarily EasyJet aircraft parked up, some British Airways uh, short haul aircraft parked at Bournemouth Airport, also here in the UK. Now, the question of uh, liquidity is important because even a grounded airline still costs money. So if you don't have liquidity, even if you are hibernating, so to speak, which is what many airlines are now doing, you still have to keep your aircraft maintained. If not ready for immediate service, they certainly have to be in long-term storage uh, in a state of uh, uh, good repair. But whenever that time may come that they are, are required again, that costs money in terms of uh, uh, spare parts in terms of the engineering personnel needed to do that. Pilots who are not flying have to maintain their recency. Typically, pilots have to fly at least once each month uh, in order to keep their, their current license. So there's a cost there. You can't simply get rid of all your staff in that way. Other staff costs, though, it's essential that you do seek ways to, to cut those costs. And uh, sadly, we've seen many people on reduced working unpaid leave and in some cases job losses. It's a delicate balance because of course airlines want to make sure they have enough staff to start up to whatever scale uh, is required when there is evidence there is some movement again in the marketplace. Now some airlines uh, have a particular challenge with liquidity. They can only survive maybe a matter of weeks or months. The Archer has said uh, recently that um, you know, the, some airlines maybe have a couple of months of cash. Some of the most healthy 
could potentially go up to one or even two years. We're talking here about groups like Ryanair, Wizz Air in Europe, uh, in the, the low cost uh, segment of the market or IAG uh, as a large network carrier. Some airlines have got even further challenges and in, on the other hand opportunities. EasyJet's an interesting case in point. There's been a lot of news flow in the past uh, 48 hours about one of EasyJet's major shareholders, indeed the founder of the airline, Stelios Hajianu, who is not only unhappy but he thinks the airline has grown too quickly prior to this crisis but is uh, demanding that the airline cancels its order for 107 outstanding airbuses that are due for delivery and threatening that if he doesn't get some redress on this by tomorrow midday tomorrow then he will seek to remove the entire board of easyjet uh, that's, a, that's a challenge the management could do without on top of the, the covid external challenge Interestingly enough, though, aside from that particular problem, if we look here on the right at the fleet chart. This was EasyJet's planned base growth in fleet prior to the crisis. Of course, the entire fleet is now grounded. They do at least have flexibility in their contract with Airbus to take the fleet right down here. This is quite unusual. Not many airlines enjoy the flexibility that uh, EasyJet actually does enjoy uh, here. And I think maybe for the first time, we may see some of that used with either deliveries not coming through or aircraft being possibly taken out of orders, depending on how this dispute plays out. And let's not forget um, the other side of the, the equation. Air airlines are bleeding, but so too are airports. Without their airline customers, they lose revenues both in aeronautical uh, revenue streams, such as landing charges and passenger fees, and of course, non-aeronautical and commercial revenues, which are more and more important today, given there is uh, increasing pressure on airline fees without passengers going through the airport of course you don't have any retail spend car parking and so on so airports have also needed to shed their capital expenditure programs and their daily operating costs in some cases we've seen partial inf infrastructure infrastructure closures uh, we've seen staff reductions and in some cases already we've seen entire airports closing london city airport in the uk it's one example that's uh, closed its doors in, in the last day or two, and Orly Airport in Paris uh, has done the same to all commercial traffic. So what are the right measures? What are the right actions right now? Well, airlines should be looking to self-help measures where they can. I've spoken to one or two of the stronger players. They have explained to me this is what they're doing. They're looking to their own shareholders, looking to their own cash reserves and uh, lines of credit to, to support themselves, making cuts in output, as I've indicated. Is a government bailout the right solution? Not necessarily. It's been talked about in the USA, a number of countries in Europe, where the UK, the UK is reserving judgment. It can be tricky because arguably not all, uh, not all uh, airlines are worthy of saving. They may be in a bad state and would have been destined to fail with or without this particular crisis coming along. Uh, we also have a challenge of um, the fact that um, it has to be a level playing field. Do you help the weak players and the strong players? And what about the question of partial nationalizations? We've heard talks about some airlines may be renationalized. I think that's the wrong way to go. You know, we moved away from this. We've seen really positive steps by privatization. We shouldn't go down that track unless it's absolutely the last resort for those airlines that are essential to the, the lifeblood of their respective uh, countries. However, other more general um, actions which governments can take at the help of the whole industry are valuable such as waiving aviation taxes in the case of airports airport concession fees where uh, airports are run for regions and countries by by commercial uh, um, management teams we've seen the waiving of the 80 20 slot rule by which airlines of course must use their slots uh, 80 percent of a given season that's been waived now till the end of the summer that's very useful and there are broader macroeconomic measures which governments are taking, which can help airlines, which are applied to other sectors such as salary support. So why, why do I think this might not be a normal recovery? Well, I'm not a pessimist, but I think I am a realist. I don't buy into the optimism expressed by some that this is going to be over and done with by middle of summer, that two or three months down the line, we're going to have this virus behind me i just don't see it um, yes it's true to say china is ahead of a curve and we are seeing some evidence of recovery on domestic flights there with some load factors up to about 60 percent but i just don't think it's possible to make that comparison with europe right now there's nothing to give us any evidence of uh, green shoots uh, coming through at the moment in terms of customers returning and in any case 
the industry is not going to look the same. Many airlines and airports aren't going to make it. Not all the airlines or the airports are going to come back from this crisis. They're going to be gone forever. Uh, I'm convinced aviation, sad to say, is going to be much smaller than it is today. Likely, there'll likely be much more consolidation in Europe, which was needed, but not in this maybe dramatic and uh, uh, aggressive way, which is likely to play out now. I think we've also got to factor in the environment, which was already rightly uh, uh, an increasing issue for aviation. And now after what some might see as a warning from nature, which uh, COVID-19 is providing, uh, we could see other changes in the structure linked to this. We might see less short haul operations uh, where rail could be developed further. Perhaps that would be politically expedient. We could see reduced numbers of long haul flights for discretionary leisure travel. And perhaps we might see different attitudes to travel, people reflecting on what does this mean for our planet, a kind of a wake up call that makes, makes people reflect about traveling altogether, especially for leisure purposes. So we look at some of the scenarios that, that uh, might influence this. Um, which airlines are going to be out there to meet whatever demand comes back? What is the size and shape of their network going to be? What type of business models are going to prevail? And what aircraft are going to be used? And when countries come out of this crisis, you know, are they going to open their borders or are they going to keep them closed? Because they've seen the dangers of importing this virus to their shores. Those countries that are very reliant on tourism, such as we see in southern Mediterranean in Europe, will people want to travel to those countries anyway? And never mind the country's ability to receive them. And I think a very interesting challenge, and I know Daniel was telling me we had a question about this uh, prior to starting the, the webinar, social distancing. I spoke to a couple of people last week who said that medically the advice is that's the last thing we need to keep doing to get rid of this virus is keep social distancing, distancing for quite some time. It could be a potential ongoing challenge, by which I mean not only could it limit travel if we have to have more spacing out in, let's say, hotels, restaurants, and so on, indeed airports, but of course on flights. If airlines have got to fly services with, let's say, each middle seat free or running at 50% of capacity, what does that mean for the commercial viability of any flights that come back? It could be a real challenge, apart from which the psychological question of whether people are going to be comfortable to be sitting on, let's say, a high density aircraft in the short to medium term. And how much demand are we going to get in total anyway? We're talking now about global recession and depression. We're talking about uh, job losses. That's certainly going to impact on leisure travel. There aren't going to be those people with money in their pockets to come back in the same volumes that we've seen till now. On the business side of the equation, very important for many airlines who focus on that typically higher margin business traveler. Again, we're seeing failures of businesses. Travel bans are in place. There's a rapid adoption by all of us of uh, online meeting technology. Now, we saw that before after, for example, 9-11, but we're so much further on in the efficiency of these tools today. Is that going to lead to people thinking, well, we don't need to travel as much? So this very important business travel remains permanently reduced for the future and also a reduced willingness to pay the higher premium fares, which many airlines rely on. I think it goes without saying some older aircraft may never return to service. For me, this is a great picture. Lovely British Airways retro livery 747s, but how many, if any of those are going to come back? Is that marvelous aircraft going to be gone for good in favor of smaller, more efficient, more environmentally friendly aircraft? I think some business models are going to be under threat as well. Long haul low cost in particular is a model which has proved very popular with customers, but it was struggling to make profits even before COVID-19 came along. We've lost WOW, we've lost Primera in the last couple of years. Norwegian is desperately looking for a cash injection, which it seems likely to get from the Norwegian government, but I don't think it's um, unreasonable to suggest that airline has a good chance of at least reducing in size. Who knows, maybe they would drop all of their long-haul operations and go back to where they began to be an intra-European airline. AirAsia, AirAsia X has always struggled out in the Far East uh, with its uh, business model in profitability. Will that see cutbacks as well? I think as we come to conclusions, the, these are the kind of scenarios, these are the kind of factors that we need to consider. But one thing that would be really helpful, and maybe the industry should be gearing itself up right now to try to work together and lobby for this would be a move to a truly global regulatory approach to help the reconstruction of the industry by which i mean if we had greater freedom with regard to traffic rights instead of this really 
national or regional methodology which allows or doesn't allow airlines to operate in particular markets. At the end of the day, we're talking about a global business and a global business which we need to help restore the world in economic strength uh, after we've all got through this uh, current enormous challenge. I think also looser regulation and flexibility towards ownership and control. Why do we have a global industry that says that people who don't come from a particular geography or political region are not allowed to be owners of a, a majority stake in an airline? This would be a, certainly a, a positive step and something that we should be aspiring towards. So before we move to the questions, um, last couple of comments I'd like to give you to reflect on, trying to end on a note of hope. Uh, amongst all this uncertainty we face currently. One thing this virus has done, it's linking humanity in a crisis, and that crisis is manifesting itself enormously on our industry, all around us, decimation all over the place for the airline world. Now, none of us can yet see a clear future, but I would like to hope that a new aviation order could come in, even if it is smaller, even if it is structured differently, even if pricing and so on is different. And it could yet again link humanity as a force for good in every sense of a term. So with that thought to leave you with, I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope that's been some useful, short and diverse reflection for you. And I'm delighted now to engage with you with your questions and comments, anything you want to bring to the table while we have the, the time left this afternoon. So thank you all again. Thank you so much for that, John. That was that was great. Um, really summed up a really complex issue there um, in a short period of time. So really appreciate that. Um, we do have a lot of questions, as I as I suspected. Um, yes. Yeah. The first one coming in from Bernie, um, who I, I think you may know. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi, Bernie. Back back to the point um, you mentioned regarding pilots. Um, so Bernie asked, could airlines get zero flight time clearance for pilots so that they can maintain their license purely by uh, simulator time? That I wouldn't claim to have enough technical knowledge to answer completely, Bernie. I have seen, and you may well have seen it too, um, some flexibility given by the UK CAA already. And if I'm not mistaken, I seem to remember they have said that rather than this uh, one month interval, they're going to extend it to something like four months. And I know there is discussion for sure about use of simulators rather than actual uh, flight deck work to keep up that recency. So I'm sure that is something which is in uh, discussion. It's, it's imperative because I think in terms of the amount of flying that's going on is going to be vastly less than the number of pilots around. So everything to uh, give that flexibility is going to be a, be a critical element in recovery. Okay, thanks, John. I hope that, that sort of answers your question there, Bernie. Um, and the next question is from Philip. Uh, Philip asks, airlines rely heavily on their distribution partners. Um, what will happen if these sales channels are affected and how will airline sales um, get back up once there are new, uh, well, the, once the routes are reopened? Interesting question. I mean, I mean, airlines are going through a massive change or have been going through a massive change in distribution for quite some years now. And of course, the watchword is very much digital. Airlines wanting to uh, take as much direct control of uh, bookings as they can. There's been the ongoing dialogue, uh, battle, call it what you will, between airlines and the, the, the GDS uh, providers many more ways of booking uh, direct on telephone apps and so on. I think it's going to force that pace because if we're going to be under pressure of lower demand, uh, more fragile pricing, uh, airlines are going to want to make sure that they can get out there and aggressively obtain that business if there's less to go around and they will need to do it in an ever more cost effective way and in an ever more effective way of actually reaching consumers and showing consumers what they have to offer and making sure that they entice them to book on their flights. So I think the pace of change is likely to quicken and the channel uh, composition is likely to change in ways that we perhaps can't even imagine as yet. Indeed. Um, the next question, John, we've got from Shalini um, and she's got a, a couple of questions here. The, the first one, uh, is around the outlook for graduates of air transport management and the ability to find a job in the, in the coming months. Um, so do you want to answer that one first, then I'll, I'll get to the next one. 
Yeah, sure. I, I mean, it's, it's a very pertinent question. I know a lot of people who are studying uh, in aviation or wish to join the industry who are in contact with me, for example, by uh, LinkedIn, uh, are wondering the same thing. Uh, all I could say is to try to be hopeful. Uh, the industry has been through many crises before. Um, there's always competition for jobs in aviation. It is, uh, I guess, luckily, it's a popular industry that many of us have chosen to work in rather than uh, working in because we have no other choice. It's a, it's a positive choice. I think keep open-minded uh, about how you may get started in the industry. It's not about what level of job or what title or status. It's about getting experience. And I think right now, what I call it, the next generation, of uh, airline management uh, and airline employees are uh, young generation, people who have great brains, great thoughts about the world we live in in the future. And the industry is going to need that more than ever before. New thinking, new approaches. Uh, I'm an old timer, as you alluded at the beginning, Daniel. So uh, you know, I, I look with admiration at the the young generation of their view of the world. I, I learn a lot from it myself in talking to people. Um, so I think it's a it's a real strength. Uh, we're all going through whatever our age, whatever our backgrounds, this crisis together. It's quite incredible to think about that as humanity. So we've all got something to give. We can share uh, people who have been in the industry longer, share their wisdom and knowledge, and the people who are new and coming to it bring something new. So look at the ways you can hone what you have to offer. Really think about it. Uh, what Look and try to assess what you see as a challenge here and use that in marketing yourself to get into the industry uh, wherever you think there's an opportunity. Are, are there any particular roles that you see that will be, uh, I guess, in high demand when the industry recovers, John? Well, I come from a, a commercial background myself on the revenue management and network planning side. But those roles are going to have to continue because airlines are going to have to price their inventory uh, carefully and correctly and dynamically. They're going to have to manage their networks in whatever shape they are, whatever size they are uh, effectively. But there's so many others, the financial management of a business, the operational dynamics, the front line in terms of the customer service and delivery, the engineering piloting it all these roles are going to be required and the number of people needed in these roles is going to vary of course geographically around the world uh, as we see what transpires uh, in, in both national um, boundaries uh, in coming out of the aftermath of this crisis and in terms of the government wish to push forward e economies again so uh, there's a there's a whole variety there and it's not really possible yet to see exactly how that will all shape up okay and the, the next question here comes from oliver um oliver wants to know if you can see airlines breaking their lease agreements and returning aircrafts to uh lessers en masse um will they let them do that or defer lease payments i'm sure all of those all of those balls are going to be in play. Uh, there are definitely going to be airlines who uh, are going to be so desperate they are going to want to get out of leases or they're going to want to have uh, payment holidays. Equally, uh, the lessors themselves are going to have to manage their risk when they have hundreds of aircraft on, on their books. And uh, if that means they take some short-term pain by uh, allowing airlines a bit, a bit of breathing space, they will they will be uh, looking, I think, to provide that flexibility as far as they can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, as I mentioned, you know, we're going to see some aircraft uh, coming out of service completely, uh, be they owned or leased. Uh, that could lead to more surplus in the marketplace uh, of uh, capacity around, yeah. uh, depending on how much the industry actually shrinks. And, of course, we have the irony that prior to this um, this massive challenge coming to hit us. We already had the, the, the question mark over the, the return to service of Boeing's 737 MAX. We had some other aircraft technical issues causing delays into service of uh, new types like the 777-9 uh, from Boeing or engine issues and delivery delays on Airbus 321 NEOs. These were all blocks to capacity, but I think at the moment we're gonna see capacity free up. It might put pressure in that sense on, on lease rates the future, which at least would be a good thing from the airline side of the tracks, if not for the, the lessors themselves. Okay. Um, uh, a question here from Lisa, um, more sort of big picture. 
Uh, do you see an opportunity to reframe the foundations of the global airline industry um, from this coming out of this crisis? Absolutely. I mean, we, we talk a lot about consolidation in the industry and we've seen it happen more than anywhere in the USA uh, over the last um, 20, 30 plus years. It's happened more in Europe, uh, less so in other parts of the world, such as the Gulf and in Asia. But I think there's a need for it to happen there. And some other uh, commentators in the industry the last few days have uh, talked to me about the need to quicken the pace and consolidation there. As mm -hmm. I mentioned it in my closing comments, for regulatory background, there should be a push to change that, to make it easier, to make it simpler, to make it more consistent, to reflect that it is supporting a global industry and not a, not a localized industry. But I think this business models, as I alluded to, get to change. For many years, the strongest players have learned the lessons which really came strongly initially out of a low cost airline model about cost management, about productivity, about distribution channels, about uh, uh, unbundling of uh, fares and so on. And I think all of these things are going to be really catalyzed more than ever by this crisis because it's the ones who are going to make it are the ones who are the most dynamic, the most uh, quick to move, and the ones who are most innovative and responsive to what they see as the changes in the marketplace around them as that market and as those markets start to return. Yeah. Um, question here from, from Matt around business travel. Um, do you think business travel will be reduced forever? Um, will, if so, uh, will LCCs recover uh, quicker than legacy carriers? And obviously LCCs have less reliance on business travel. So. Do you think uh, legacy carriers are going to need to reprice and reconfigure their aircrafts following the crisis? I think it's yeah, I think it's a big challenge. Um, I must admit, I remember back to 9/11 in 2001, thinking then that business travel was gone forever and we would never see the likes of it again in full yeah. premium cabins and high margins of profitability as we'd seen up to that time. But it did take time, but there was a recovery. I am less convinced the same thing will happen this time. Because as I mentioned, I think the the era of video conferencing has moved on dramatically. I mean, I've even started using software myself in the last two weeks that has been stunning. Indeed, what we're doing now with this webinar that maybe didn't exist uh, even a, a couple of years ago. And had we bought shares in Zoom meetings, for example, we might all be looking to be a bit better off right now uh, if we'd known what was coming. But I mean, that doesn't substitute for being face to face and meeting clients, meeting colleagues. I think it's still going to be there. But we were already seeing airlines adapting products. Uh, first class has all but gone on many airlines because the quality of business class service on long haul has gone up so phenomenally. But even there, uh, I was talking to somebody today about uh, Emirates out in Dubai. And Emirates is very much an airline that relies uh, substantially on business travel and has a very high quality product. But even they had already started ahead of this crisis to look at uh, business class light, so to speak, where you would get your business class seat, but you wouldn't necessarily get the access to a lounge, or you would, could choose the actual seat uh, later in the process and not get some of the other normal attributes of a product. I think we may see uh, an extension of that, breaking out business travel components as we've seen in the economy cabin. Of course, premium economy has been on the rise too. It's been a nice complement to, to business travel uh, up mm. to now from those airlines who have introduced it, but I think it could become more of a, a substitute in some cases. So I think margins are going to be under pressure. Volumes of business travel, I think, are going to be down for the, for the foreseeable future, certainly particularly those driven by uh, in, a, in the segment of the high price. But yeah. as, you, as your question asked, low-cost carriers have also tapped into business travel in the short haul arena, and they've been successful there. I think they will still go after that because they've used a price advantage while at the same time offering frequency and they have been the ones given their less reliance overall on business travel to come back more quickly because their lean cost structures allow them to go in and kickstart the market with their low prices and we've seen companies like Ryanair do that in the past I'm sure they'll do it again if we just think of what Ryanair has said already it reckons it can survive a year maybe even towards two years with zero revenue coming in uh, given the, the cash reserves it has and assets uh, uh, under its um, ownership. And and just just on that, John. Um, obviously, uh, if if an air, an airline like JetBlue, for 
for example, uh, comes through this, which it looks looks likely, and they, they do continue with the uh, transatlantic uh, route. Do you think they will be um, in a in a good position? Because that, of that's an interesting one, because uh, prior to this, JetBlue was looking at maybe starting, if not later this year, certainly into next year, transatlantic, and they've already got orders in place. Of course, the Airbus 321, uh, I can't remember if it's LR or XLR, definitely the LR, and they can use those perfectly on their East Coast routes out of Boston and New York into the higher volume uh, European routes. It, this may be an interesting example of where mm. Destiny steps in, and although they look like they would have a pretty good chance, now could be the moment to strike because their, their whole idea is to go in and put low affairs in in that premium segment of the market. Now, if you're starting from zero and you can charge, let's say, a thousand dollars for just for argument's sake from somewhere like Boston to London and someone else is charging four thousand dollars, you've got nothing to lose because you're gaining that customer from nothing. And if we're in this aftermath of businesses across multiple sectors reeling from the consequences of uh, what is happening to us now with this virus, that could really get them into a, a head start. Plus capacity at airports they perhaps thought they would never get into. Let's imagine even Heathrow, which was full, suddenly they find they can get into there with decent frequency. Yeah. So it's a very interesting one to bring up on that uh, point. Um, next question we've got here is from, from Tony. Um, Tony asks, does John see that domestic flying will be the first shoots of aviation recovery across Europe? Um, perhaps Italy, which is obviously ahead of the, the curve um, when, when it comes to the virus, uh, would they provide a useful guide to how other nations will react? Yeah, it's also interesting because you know I, I talked about the apparent recovery of some domestic air travel in China, and yes, it, it doesn't involve the, the boundaries of uh, going outside of countries and borders and quarantine and so on. But we're seeing challenges, admittedly not everywhere, from high-speed rail and uh, the environmentalists you come in asking questions about that. I think in part it will depend how short or long those domestic flights are. I think to have a chance, they probably need to be flights for the, uh, over an hour in length, other than maybe specific uh, smaller and very important regional markets where many of these routes are, are lifeline operations. So it might happen. But uh, I'm not completely sure you know, how much domestic travel is going to stay in the future if rail is able to be offered as an alternative. But having said that, uh, it costs a lot of money to invest in rail infrastructure. It's not there in all countries. Not every rail route can be a high-speed train in the way we see in large parts of France, for example, between Spain and France or intra-Europe uh, from the UK to France or Belgium. So, um, yeah, interesting one to... To watch in the coming months in the booking trends. Okay, um, next question is from Julian. Um, he says, I hear many representative bodies talking in the name of airlines asking for, for large government uh, support, uh, e.g. Uh, for example, IATA. Um, while the airlines are much more subtle on their speech, uh, focusing on PR, mm -hmm. with, uh, repatriation flights and cargo flights bringing much needed supplies. Um, he says the difference of speech is striking. Is it a bad cop, good cop game where airlines show the good behavior to bring more public acceptance to future aids and are using IATA or others to do the difficult speech? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I think, I think IATA's got got a global role to play. I mean, it doesn't represent every airline, but it represents a, a, a vast number of airlines in the world. And there are other industry bodies uh, alongside the Arta on a more localized basis, perhaps typically. Um, I don't see it particularly as a good cop, bad cop situation. I think it's really that there is not a unified view amongst airlines. You know, we know that airlines are a broad church, it's a broad community of many different kinds of airlines. You know, I think close to home here in the UK, there is no love lost whatsoever between certain major UK players thinking of a long haul arena and not mentioning any names specifically at the moment. Uh, some airlines are in strong financial health with big cash reserves, others are not. And it would suit some airlines very nicely to stop others uh, get, getting assistance to let them fail. It would equally uh, help others who maybe uh, have not uh, got themselves into uh, the state ideally they should be to receive a bailout. So it's a really complex one from a government point of view. Consolidation, law of the jungle, 
it, it would happen uh, in a in a massive crisis like this if there wasn't some government involvement. But the delicacy there is between preserving the, what airlines offer uh, in terms of being an economic catalyst uh, for business and leisure travel, not to mention cargo movements as well, yeah. and not just dosing everybody with money and simply keeping a kind of a status quo, even in a reduced basis, which will not move the industry along in the right direction. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Um, uh, next question from, from Paul. Um, does John really believe a global regulatory approach will happen? The Open Skies regulation is facing such a challenge even before the crisis started. I, I think that's a fair point. Uh, what I'm trying to say there is I, I think we should be aspiring to that. And if we don't push now, you know, mm. uh, one of my clients said to me recently, I think it was talking about uh, Iceland. When Iceland went through the volcanic ash crisis, Iceland Air's line was never waste a good crisis. Mm. And they certainly didn't. They got some benefit out of it. So we couldn't have a worse crisis than this. So if our industry leaders do not seize now, on the chance to get the attention of politicians and governments worldwide to bring us uh, a more unified global uh, regulatory structure. We never will. So uh, yes, we've got to be realistic. It's going to be extremely hard to do it. And there is a massive difference in thinking about airlines all over the world and different local political agendas. But to push forward now and aspire to it and work at it, at least we'll deliver something. If we are just defeatist from the outset, then sure as heck we won't get anywhere. So I think we have to push. Yeah, definitely. And and just on, the, I think we touched upon this a little bit earlier. There's a question from Goda here, just regarding um, dynamic pricing going forward after the crisis. Um, do you think that airlines will invest in smarter pricing and offers uh, or platforms like NDC, or do you think those kind of projects will be on hold um, for the foreseeable future? I think absolutely they will do it. Uh, it's going to be essential because I think price is going to become an even bigger variable for the reasons I mentioned. We're going to have a smaller industry, but also weaker demand, uh, more challenging uh, conditions in which to deliver any kind of commercial viability and profitability and long-term uh, financial certainty for airlines. So getting your pricing right and trying to get exactly the, the, the maximum each customer is willing to pay for whatever product they are buying is going to be important. So I don't think uh, NDC and other aspects of pricing and distribution are going to really be parked. Uh, I think they're going to, going to be pushed forward. And uh, if there's any cash available beyond the, the running of a business, I think this is a kind of one of the kind of areas that airlines are likely to invest in to, to move this forward more quickly. And it will be a differentiator even more for the strong airlines versus those that uh, don't seize that opportunity. Yeah, indeed. Um, I have a question here. Um, we, we did touch upon this a little bit, but it's a question from Roderick. Um, looking at the impact of post-COVID on traditional versus LCCs, uh, what are the big factors that favor one over the other in standing up uh, post, uh, post the crisis? Well, cash, cash is king is, is first and foremost uh, the, the critical element of survival. Uh, then good management skills in a business are important. And we see uh, leaders of the world's most uh, powerful airlines, the likes of you know, Woody Walsh, Tim Clark, Michael O'Leary, Alan Joyce, that they have got their companies through numerous crises before. Uh, they've boxed clever, they've uh, changed their their direction. Uh, I think this is the type of mentality we will see again. And I've mentioned there leaders of some large airline groups, but equally there are some niche operators, maybe in specific segments. I'm thinking particularly, for example, regional airlines. Uh, we have a number of extremely well-managed regional airlines here in Europe in their particular geographies. They've shown innovation and dynamism. They need help right now because that part of the market is very difficult to survive in, in the best of times. But they're, they've shown energy. They've done things differently. They've taken uh, uh, opportunities. And I think uh, that management skill is going to be a big differentiator combined with as big a cash resources as you can manage to, to muster in an airline. 
Thanks, John. And uh, last last couple of questions. We only got a, we only have a few minutes left here, unfortunately. Um, how long do you think the recovery will take? Um, this is from Chris. Uh, are we looking at a continued slowdown through the Christmas peak? I think it uh, is going to be a long, slow recovery, and any parameters in the year that we would regard as typical peaks, such as the the summer season coming up now, in fact, just started in the schedules, particularly in uh, in Europe uh, and uh, Northern Hemisphere, will be far from a normal summer this year. Uh, we we have, of course, Easter coming up in a few weeks, uh, it, which will affect many European markets, would normally be a, a small travel peak. I don't think that's going to happen. Well, we're not going to have flights for a start, so that certainly won't happen. Christmas, again, is a, a big time of movement, uh, provided that people are able to move and that we don't have yet another uh, trauma to contend with, like a resurgence of this virus um, in the winter months. Um, I still think Christmas and, and, and other times of peak demand are going to be substantially weaker uh, in the year ahead. I, I think the whole recovery is actually going to run into years. Uh, I saw uh, another report today, uh, I think it was um, uh, Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan saying they estimated two years and I would tend to say yeah, longer and shorter for recovery time. Yeah, and uh, last question, John, just, just for me actually, um, I was just thinking about, I saw an article earlier on this and I was, I was, I was, um, I made a note to ask you, um, when we do return, um, to normal or, or some form of normal, uh, there's going to obviously going to be a lot of routes up for grabs. Um, now, do you think that uh, long haul narrow body aircrafts will kind of change the nature of international networks by replacing the traditional hub and spoke models, um, looking at more point to point flying? I've always uh, been a defender of the hub model as still being uh, very viable, uh, but I think this does give a boost uh, to you know, the, the very long range narrow body equipment, which we're, we're now getting, certainly led by Airbus, in a, in yeah. assuming the, the, the 737 MAX can get through its current grounding challenge. It doesn't have the same range and payload that the 321 LR and XLR is offering. So yeah. I think uh, given airlines caution, uh, and, and even if it's not narrow bodies, smaller wide bodies like the, the 350, which is doing very well in service, the, the 787, uh, maybe a little larger, the 777, 9, when that comes into service, I think uh, emphasis on taking less risk, uh, getting a better result on filling up what capacity you have on a consistent basis throughout the year is going to become even more a watchword for airlines rather than these very high volumes and of course the smaller aircraft you have generally speaking the less need uh, to make uh, connections there is because you can hopefully fill up more of what you're offering on a on a point-to-point -point basis but it's still it's still uncertain it's still not clear how that will play out but I think definitely that, it would, that is going to lead to further evolution in business models and the, the type of capacity and uh, uh, the mix between point to point and connecting traffic that we see today. Having said that, there are still going to be routes which, uh, even prior to this, could never, uh, never justify flights on their own, uh, yeah. no matter what low-level prices were offered. And uh, so there will still be still be some kind of connecting activity at, at hub airports, and it gives airlines flexibility to chop and change their pricing in different markets because they can link flights to others in that model. And do you, do you think this will help or detract from the push to go to uh, electric for you know some of those shorter haul routes? Uh, I don't think it's going to bring it quick enough. I'm not an expert in that, but everything I'm hearing is that viable electric flying, other than perhaps for some smaller regional markets, cannot be delivered so quickly. We would hope that this will lead to an impetus to move on all the elements that, are, that contribute to the environment, whether that is biofuels, uh, more efficient air traffic control systems. Indeed, we could see pressure taken off air traffic control anyway in the short term by less volume. But there has to be that direction, and I, uh, I think environment is going to drive changes in all aspects of um, the aviation industry uh, here on in as we come out of this crisis. Okay. And very last question. This is uh, one that's just come in from Agnieszka, um, and slightly controversial, but do you think still think we'll need uh, another runway at Heathrow? 
That's interesting because I, I, I have reflected on that a few times myself in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I think I even wrote in a, a paper the other day, I think it could become an academic question uh, in the short to medium term. I've always been a supporter and believed that that was the right capacity in the right place for the airline industry if the UK wanted to sustain and increase its role uh, in the world, especially the UK in a post-Brexit environment. But at the moment, I think we have to see what level of traffic reduction uh, becomes uh, the norm uh, as we move out of this crisis. I think the pressure on that issue will be off short term and at least uh, for a couple of years ahead or so, the airport, which has been squeezed to maximum capacity, may find it actually has some uh, spare capacity for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, John, that, that's all we have time for. Um, but okay. Huge thank you to you for uh, for joining us. Thanks for some great questions. It's really uh, taxed my brain this afternoon. And <laughs> I hope it's been valuable to everybody who's been listening in and putting in the questions too. Indeed. A big thank you yeah, to, uh, to you and to our audience. Um, for those of you that have been asking, uh, yes, we have recorded this webinar and you can watch it back. We can share it with colleagues. Um, we'll release that in the next next few days. Uh, it'll be available on our website and through various other channels in the coming days. So, so look out for those emails. Um, as mentioned earlier, we are currently developing uh, the content and schedule for more webinars. So if you are interested in hosting or joining a webinar, please do feel free to contact me directly at daniel.boyle at terrapin.com. And um, that's daniel.boyle at terrapin.com. And make sure that you sign up for next week's session. I'm um, looking at the USA with Henry Hartvelt. Uh, there is a limit on how many of you can join live, so please make sure that you do sign up as much as possible. Um, again, thanks to you and thanks to John and our audience, and we, we look forward to joining uh, you, you joining us again next week um, in the State of Play series. Thank you.